Chapter Eleven of That Affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Clue of the Broken Crutch. Mr. Clavering's desire to investigate the woods cooled, and he walked quickly back toward the manor. When he came again to the boggish meadow, he was surprised to behold Mary Gray in walking skirt and blouse of the inevitable gray and bareheaded, threading her way over it. He waited until she reached the road. "'Why did you not tell me that you were going for a walk, Mr. Clavering?' she called smilingly. "'I should have enjoyed going with you. I am an enthusiast on walking.' Her cool assurance nettled him. "'Are you in the habit of instituting walking tours with gentlemen?' he inquired severely. Mary Gray threw back her brown head and laughed mirthfully. "'Oh, dear, no. I am in the habit of having the gentlemen institute them and invite me to join.' Mr. Clavering stiffened. "'If you wish to avoid a cold,' he remarked irrelevantly, "'I should suggest that you change your boots. They appear to be wet.' Mary Gray thrust forth a trim little foot and surveyed it carelessly. "'My boots are wet, but I never take cold,' she said indifferently. "'Mr. Clavering, did you ever see more beautiful ferns than these? The woods are filled with them.' But Mr. Clavering did not look at the feathery bouquet of ferns she held out to him. His eyes were attracted by the dark, slimy mud covering her dainty boots and staining her skirts. She followed his glance, and a shade of annoyance passed over her face. She turned abruptly toward the manor. "'I had no idea the meadow was so boggy,' she observed, with slightly heightened color. Nor was it sufficiently boggy to muddy her boots and skirts, as they were muddied, Mr. Clavering felt sure. Moreover, she had picked her way across the meadow with great care. He preserved an austere silence as he strove to keep pace with her. She, on her part, chattered inconsequently of the various species of fern to be found in different sections of the country. Upon entering the manor, Mr. Clavering sought out Burton, whom he finally found in the last place he had expected to find him, that is, in his own chamber, where his presence was causing great distress to Jenkins. Mr. Clavering was not pleased at the intrusion in his absence, but he had enough of the detective in him to feel that it might be excusable. Burton was busily sounding the walls with hammer and mallet, while Jenkins stood by, the picture of outraged dignity. "'I didn't countenance this entering and hammering, Mr. Clavering, sir,' he began apologetically. "'But he would come in, sir, and said it was in the interest of justice. I made so bold as to suggest, sir, that justice could wait till you came back, but he wouldn't hear of it, sir.' "'No time like the present, Jenkins,' remarked Burton, without ceasing his hammering. "'No offence, I hope, Mr. Clavering?' "'Not at all,' replied Mr. Clavering, but his tone was cold. "'You may go now, Jenkins. "'May I ask, Mr. Burton, what you expect to find in this room? "'I have myself carefully sounded the walls, and was able to discover nothing.' "'Then you didn't do your work thoroughly,' said Burton brusquely. "'The wall on this side is hollow, indicating without doubt a secret passage, "'by means of which the necklace was stolen. "'If I don't find the entrance soon, I shall ask her ladyship's permission to make one.' "'And if she doesn't give permission, I'll go ahead myself, in the interests of justice,' he added with grim humour. "'I am bound to remark that I consider your work more or less a waste of time,' observed Mr. Clavering disapprovingly. "'Granted that you will discover a secret passage, what will it avail you when the thief and murderer is still at large? You hardly expect to find him in the passage, I suppose?' Burton laughed rather nastily at Mr. Clavering's sarcasm. "'Don't you try to give points to Scotland Yard, Mr. Clavering.' We don't need em, and we don't want them from amateurs. You take it from me. We're hot on the clue, and when we're ready, we'll just round up the quarry. But in the meantime, with your permission, I'm going to unearth some of the secrets this old house is groaning with. It's my belief the whole place is honeycombed with secret passages. Scotland Yard is by no means infallible, retorted Mr. Clavering, ruffling up like an angry turkey cock, and has frequently been obliged to rely upon the valuable assistance rendered by the unofficial detective. "'Bookshop rubbish,' scoffed Burton. "'Not at all, sir,' bristled Mr. Clavering. "'And let me advise you, sir, before you waste time in demolishing walls, to send a posse of men to scour the woods about here. There is a suspicious character hiding in them.' And he told of the man who had accosted the woman and child. But he was true to his promise made to Lady Ursula, and so said nothing of having seen the same woman in the library the night before. "'Rot!' ejaculated Burton. That fellow was only a common footpad. All respect to you, Mr. Clavering, but while you're running over the universe for clues, you don't see what is right under your nose. 
we know where our man is even if his own sister doesn't even if his own sister doesn't mr clavering found himself blankly repeating the words burton then was convinced of robert sylvester's guilt he himself was arriving at that stage where he no longer dared to have convictions robert had never been a favorite of his and now his unexplained absence following upon the finding of his pistol in the library was certainly damaging but he felt that it behooved him as an old friend of the family to speak a word for the boy and he was about to do so when there came a quick tap upon the door her ladyship i'll bet a guinea exclaimed burton with a confidential wink the familiarity of which roused mr clavering's indignation but it proved to be mary gray girlish and dainty in some filmy frock burton did not appear pleased i heard that you were here mr burton she began lightly apparently unconscious that she was not welcome and i thought as i was so familiar with the room it having been lady pevensey's that i might be able to help you in whatever you were searching for i don't know that i need any help growled burton oh then you have found the entrance stepping quickly past the astounded mr clavering she crossed to the massive wrought fireplace and pressed upon one of the broad long panels in the dark oak chimney-breast at the right of the hearth with a slight creaking the panel opened disclosing a narrow space beyond mary gray laughed in burton's disgruntled face i have heard of your fondness for demolishing whatever baffles you and i want to spare this fine old manor follow me gentlemen and we will investigate she slipped into the passage with burton like a bloodhound at her heels mr clavering followed cautiously he wondered at her effrontery in acknowledging her familiarity with this passage particularly before him any doubts that he had felt as to who had entered his room the night before were now dispelled with a sense of choking indignation he followed her guidance through the stuffy winding corridor that would have been absolutely dark were it not for her pocket flashlight didn't i tell you this old place was honeycombed with passages chuckled burton triumphantly quite as though the discovery had been his mr clavering groaned assent he felt that he must suffocate if he did not soon breathe fresh air stumblingly he followed his guides up a narrow flight of stairs on which their footsteps echoed ghost-like even then he fell to speculating on the terror it would cause lady pevensey should she chance to hear the sound can you imagine where this is leading us asked mary gray north wing gasped burton scotland yard is clever she laughed softly apparently she alone did not find the air oppressive soon she stopped before a door that yielded readily to pressure and in a moment the three stood blinking in a large and lofty room through whose age-worn hangings the sun shone cheerily it had been a sleeping chamber of former generations as the huge high canopied bed testified we are now in the oldest part of the manor unrestored i believe since the time of the tudors said mary gray in a reverent tone that sent her up a peg or two in mr clavering's esteem already his antiquarian eye was travelling with eager interest over the ivory coffers and the cypress chest with carved legs and inlaid heraldic devices that stood near the black oak wardrobe while he touched appreciatively the favourite form of elizabethan candlestick the image with clasped hands burton was diligently prowling about the chamber peering behind the tapestries poking into the wardrobe and finally pulling out the truckle bed and examining it mary gray stood watching him with a curious smile which deepened as he pounced upon a small crutch broken in two which lay under a blanket in the centre of the truckle bed mr clavering echoed his cry of astonishment nothing antique about this argued burton contemplatively it's of modern make and proves that this room has been occupied recently and by someone who used a crutch that's clear isn't it he demanded abruptly of mary gray before he could reply mr clavering took the crutch excitedly from his hands this exonerates robert sylvester he declared with relief after a brief examination how so demanded burton with an exasperating drawl robert sylvester is not lame he has never had occasion to use a crutch if he happened to be wounded in the leg or the thigh he would have occasion to use one mr clavering stared uncomprehendingly sorry to disprove you mr clavering resumed burton implacably but i have got together considerable information about robert sylvester for one thing i know that he was more or less battered and bruised in a brawl at the country club on tuesday night i also know that there has been someone secreted in this room from tuesday night 
until very recently, and that person has been sick, too. Look here. From behind the curtains of the large bed he drew forth a bottle of liniment and some strips of cloth cut in the shape of bandages. Circumstantial evidence, he remarked succinctly, and with satisfaction. Mr. Clavering felt his defense slipping away. But Robert Sylvester would require a larger crutch than this, he demurred weakly. He wasn't in a position to pick and choose. He had to take what could be got, maintained Burton stoutly. And when he found that the crutch wasn't strong enough to support him, he broke it in one of his rages. I'm told he's subject to rages. Now there's my theory, Mr. Clavering, and I flatter myself if it's a neat one and comes pretty near to the truth. What do you think of it, eh, Miss Gray? I should never venture to question the theories of Scotland Yard, she answered demurely. Burton shot at her a glance of suspicion, but she appeared perfectly serious. Mr. Clavering, however, was not satisfied. I shall venture to question your theory, Mr. Burton, and even to propound one of my own. I have made no little study of deductive methods as applied to the tracing of criminals, and as I examine this crutch, I deduce from it that its owner and the probable murderer of the Earl of Portstead was a small, thin man, afflicted with permanent lameness, and entirely dependent upon his crutch. Burton eyed him sourly. How do you make that out? In the first place, replied Mr. Clavering pompously, gaining assurance as he went on, only a small, thin man would buy so weak a crutch. And in the second place, he added, after an impressive pause, this is not a new crutch. The rubber at the end is entirely worn off. Therefore, I deduce that its owner was permanently lame. Really, Mr. Clavering, that is rather clever, exclaimed Mary Gray impulsively. Burton scowled at her. More book rubbish, he growled. You take my word for it, Mr. Clavering. While you're beating the country for your small, thin, permanently lame man, I'll have my suspect up for trial. Now I'm done with deduction, and I'm going to search every corner of this valley north wing for evidence. He set about it vigorously, and his companions assisted, but they found few traces of recent habitation in the dust-choked rooms opening off the long, bare corridor. Some were used for storerooms, as Lady Ursula had said, Others showed only bare walls and barer floors. Near a locked door at the end of the corridor, which from its location they knew opened onto the stairs, was a heavy chair overturned. Mr. Clavering viewed it with mistrust. He wondered if it could be that which had crashed into his face when he had made his first invasion into the north wing. With the discovery of this chair and of a pitcher half filled with water, Burton was forced to be content. They were about to descend by the way they had come, when they heard a key turning rapidly in the locked door at the end of the corridor. Her ladyship, surmised Burton. End of chapter 11「Chapter 12 of That Affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Dressing Table Drawer. Burton was right this time. It was her ladyship. She seemed unnaturally pale in her black frock, and her eyes held a questioning fear. "'What is the meaning of this, this intrusion?' she demanded in a high, tense voice. Mr. Clavering flushed guiltily and avoided her accusing glance. Mary Gray looked slightly self-reproachful, but Burton appeared not a whit dismayed. "'We're still on the hunt for clues, my lady,' he spoke up easily. "'But what? What could you hope to find in this closed wing? And how did you come here?' Her agitation was extreme. Burton stepped nearer, and said, with what seemed to Mr. Clavering rather brutal emphasis, "'Since your ladyship has the key to the corridor door, there is only one other way we could have come, by the secret passage from the room where Lady Pevensey's necklace was stolen.' The bolt shot home. Lady Ursula quivered, but with a manifest effort drew herself up haughtily, and returned Burton glance for glance. Coldly, she remarked, "'I suppose I must excuse the incursions of a detective.' no matter where mistaken zeal or mere idle curiosity may lead him but i am surprised that you mr clavering should be willing to accompany him to a part of the manner which i have expressly let it be known was not open to my guests miss gray best knows what is her excuse for joining you mary gray accepted her rebuke in silence but mr clavering attempted a lengthy apology in which he became hopelessly involved lady ursula cut him short it really doesn't matter mr clavering she said wearily only I am disappointed in you. That is all. She turned again to Burton, and her tone was hostile. 
i think sir i have a right to ask what presumable clues you have found in this closed section of my house burton appeared a little nonplussed by her change of manner she had succeeded in subduing all visible emotion and now with the great lady's air of calm and subtly convincing superiority was making him feel himself an unwanted and unworthy intruder but his abashment was only momentary in the exercise of what he conceived his duty he would never permit himself to be long humbled and so summoning back his assurance he sought by his customary bulldog pertinacity to break down the barrier of class hauteur she had interposed between them and to put her again upon the defensive well my lady he drawled with a gleam in his eyes at variance with his languid tone you shall judge for yourself whether my clues are presumable or not in this closed section of your house to be exact in the chamber to which the secret passage from lady pevensey's former room leads i find a bed carefully made up but showing evidences of having been slept in behind the curtains of this bed i find a bottle of liniment and some bandages and in the dressing-room opening off this chamber a pitcher half filled with fresh water that is it could not have been standing over a day at the very most if burton had expected to see her quiver again he was disappointed and that is all you found she inquired with quiet contempt no my lady that is not all burton's tone was decidedly brutal now there was a truckle bed pushed under the larger bed rolled up in the blankets i found a crutch broken in two a uh, a uh, crutch she was moved now she put forth a trembling hand and steadied herself against the jacobean writing-table something impelled burton to glance down at its dust-covered surface and he gave a start of surprise on it clear and distinct was the imprint of a hand a hand short and somewhat broad with widened fingertips he called lady ursula's attention to it with a ring of triumph in his voice another clue my lady she looked down at it caught her breath sharply slipped her hand along the table and the imprint was obliterated burton regarded her with a sardonic smile that won't do my lady miss gray you'll bear in mind and you too mr clavering the smallness of that hand and its peculiar shape that last characteristic of course might have been exaggerated by pressure upon the table which would account for the wideness of the fingertips the person who made that imprint was probably unsteady on his feet and what do you hope to prove from all this demanded lady ursula scornfully just what you hope to conceal my lady and that is her challenging scorn so exasperated burton that he almost forgot his professional caution that a man with a remarkably small hand he growled has been hidden here in this north wing with your ladyship's knowledge and connivance i shall be interested to see how you will prove that she retorted evenly burton swore between his teeth mary gray smiled at him unsympathetically and mr clavering felt utterly bewildered was it possible that lady ursula failed to realize the danger in which robert stood through burton's thinly veiled accusations the more suspicion was pointed his way the more composed she became it was all very well to persuade oneself that robert was innocent it was another thing as he knew to persuade the world the more he thought of it the less tenable appeared his own theory of the little lame man robert sylvester like all the men of his family had small and delicate hands more like a woman's than a man's in spite of himself burton's conviction was beginning to force itself upon him he had no doubt that lady ursula knew who had been concealed in the north wing and what man would she be likely to conceal there save her dearly loved scapegrace brother whom from her childhood days she had always shielded from deserved punishment burton brusquely broke the strained silence that had fallen upon them there are no more clues to be found here he said with curt conviction and with your ladyship's permission i'll go down by the stairs you came up lady ursula flushed at the insolence of his tone i think you will not wait for my permission she said in a choked voice mary gray moved by a sudden impulse laid her hand on lady ursula's arm believe me lady ursula i am very sorry she said earnestly i know how distressing all this must be for you mr clavering had not supposed her capable of womanly sympathy and he was accordingly surprised lady ursula seemed touched the hard light in her eyes softened thank you she murmured gratefully that detective is such a brute he is just a human bloodhound to be sure assented mary gray but you must not think that all detectives are so devoid of feeling 
i do not think of them at all responded lady ursula wearily except that they are probing my very heart with their merciless questioning i am sorry said mary gray again i wish that you might be spared and regretfully she followed burton mr clavering stood by ill at ease and at a loss for words lady ursula addressed him vexedly i suppose that detective has been told your wild goose tale of the gypsy who came into your room and then escaped through the library door locking it after her i gave you my word lady ursula he responded in an aggrieved tone that i would inform no one of the fact she bit her lip you persist in the story then lady ursula it has received corroboration i saw the woman again this morning you you saw her this morning gravely he told of the encounter on the lonely woodland road omitting only that the child had given him her name and place of dwelling why he did not tell this he could not have explained to himself lady ursula was unable to conceal her agitation you are sure the man did not follow them she amazed him by asking perfectly sure he skulked off into the woods as soon as i came up something in his appearance puzzled me i think that i have seen him before he studied her tense face a moment lady ursula he questioned with sudden inspiration have you any idea who the man could be lady ursula glanced at him startled then she echoed with a forbearing smile have i any idea who the man could be my dear mr clavering i did not even see him mr clavering humbled and abashed meekly agreed to her suggestion that they descend to the lower floor by means of the secret corridor though he had vowed when passing through it that he would never again be inveigled into it i have a curiosity to explore this corridor she remarked it seems that my guests and the officials of scotland yard know more of the manor than i do myself mr clavering could not control a blush of conscious guilt he felt that he had irretrievably damaged his reputation as a gentleman by thus prying into his hostess's private concerns and that no amount of excuses or apologies could reinstate him in her esteem or his own he decided then and there that the tracking of criminals was not work for a gentleman and was best left to those on the fringe of society lady ursula broke in upon his resolutions where is the entrance to this interesting passage mr clavering she inquired with a show of eagerness yet there was a hint of a false note in her voice and mr clavering felt strongly perturbed as he drew aside the tapestry in the bedchamber and revealed the passageway beyond lady ursula murmured something about the sight of that passage giving her quite a creepy medieval feeling and protested that she should have to rely on mr clavering for guidance through it but it struck him after a few steps in the dark stuffiness of the corridor that she might make the better guide of the two for whereas he was constantly stumbling and bumping his head at some unexpected turning she walked along unscathed and with even footfall at length to his relief they stepped out into lady pevensey's former chamber and lady ursula carefully closed after them the panel in the massive frame of the fireplace as though unwilling that others should share the secret of the passageway and so you think she remarked with a forced lightness of manner that your gypsy woman came through here into this room i am not at all certain he answered guardedly that the person who came into this room was the gypsy whom i later saw at the library door this unexpected reply startled her what do you mean she cried you talk in paradoxes mr clavering cleared his throat impressively his self-possession was returning and with it his detective zeal <clears throat> this is what i mean to convey lady ursula i grasped the hands of the person who came into this room and they were the hands of a lady soft and slender one who did not know might accuse you of being a connoisseur in the texture of ladies hands she interrupted with a nervous laugh but pray may not an occasional gypsy have soft and slender hands it is possible he admitted but this particular one has not i took a special notice of her hands this morning they were large and coarse moreover i do not now think that she is a gypsy indeed with a smile of half amused annoyance what do you think she is an italian an italian lady ursula's brows drew together italians are a rarity in this sleepy little village i should sooner think her a gypsy but i am still inclined to believe that your nocturnal adventure was mostly nightmare and that when you saw that woman this morning gypsy or whatever she may be your fancy invested her with the face of your dream-woman no 
Mr. Clavering said emphatically. I am a prosaic man. I do not indulge in flights of fancy, and nightmare, as I have assured you, I have never been addicted to. Lady Ursula shrugged impatiently. As you will, then. But what possible reason could any woman, gypsy or lady, have for coming into your chamber at that hour of night? Have you found anything missing, or even out of place? Mr. Clavering pondered. Ah! he exclaimed suddenly. The dressing-table drawer! Lady Ursula, when I got up in the dark to search for that woman, I discovered in a, er, rather painful fashion, that the dressing-table drawer was wide open, although it had been tightly shut when I went to bed. Lady Ursula showed intense interest. Well, she demanded breathlessly, and what did you do then? I closed it. I did not wish to come into contact with it again. When I returned from the library, I was so disturbed by what had happened that I entirely forgot about the drawer until this moment. But it must have been opened for some purpose, she suggested. That is so, he agreed. But Lady Pevensey left nothing in it. I examined it myself directly after the necklace was stolen. He crossed to the dressing table and opened the drawer. You can see for yourself. It is... He stopped short, astounded. The necklace, he cried. Lady Ursula, look here. She sprang to his side as he drew from the drawer and held up in the sunlight a magnificent chain of diamonds, a circlet of living fire. Large, perfect, rainbow-flamed were the gems, jewels worthy, indeed, a king's ransom. Tears of joy and relief shone in Lady Ursula's dark eyes. "'Thank heaven! Thank heaven!' she murmured. "'It is Lady Pevensey's necklace, and not a stone missing!' Mr. Clavering still held the gleaming crystals dazedly aloft. "'How did this get back in the drawer?' he was asking for the dozenth time. "'What does it matter how, as long as it did?' exclaimed Lady Ursula impatiently. "'Lady Pevensey must be told at once. She will be mad with joy.' Mr. Clavering collected himself at mention of Lady Pevensey. "'I will take the necklace to her immediately,' he said, advancing to the door with alacrity. At that moment the door opposite opened, and Lord Meldrum stepped into the hall. He caught sight of Lady Ursula, and of the necklace in Mr. Clavering's hand, and a glance, fraught with significance, flashed between them. Lady Ursula brushed by Mr. Clavering, and flung out appealing hands to Meldrum. "'Wilford, no news yet of Robert. And that horrible Burton will never rest till he has hounded him to despair. What am I to do?' Meldrum caught her hands and held them firmly. "'Trust to me, Ursula. Robert shall be saved from arrest, at least.' She smiled at him, a tremulous, grateful smile. "'I knew you would not let the poor boy suffer. Oh, Wilford,' she broke off, sobbing, "'this awful thing is tearing my heart in two. Meldrum drew her into his arms, kissed her with grave tenderness, released her, and walked away, his face white and grim in its determination." End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of That Affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Return of Robert Sylvester Lady Pevensey's joy over the recovery of her necklace was so exuberant that she all but embraced Mr. Clavering. Now, she said ecstatically, I feel that I can help Ursula bear her trouble with equanimity. Within two hours the bothersome jewels were on their way to the safe vault in the city, guarded by a brace of detectives and Lady Pevensey's family solicitor, who had been hastily summoned. Burton pounced upon Mr. Clavering's vague story of how he had discovered the necklace, literally tore it to shreds, and questioned and cross-questioned its author until he finally took refuge in indignant silence. Not as yet had Burton dragged from him any mention of the woman, Elena. Lady Ursula should have no reason to reproach him on the score of not keeping his word to her. On the next day was held the funeral of the Earl of Portstead. By Lady Ursula's wish, it was as quiet as one as was possible in view of the tragic nature of his death and his prominence as a statesman. Throughout the services, Lady Ursula bore herself with marked composure. She was pale but dry-eyed. Elsie Baring, on the contrary, sobbed audibly. But in spite of the many mourners gathered within the grey walls of the old manor, relatives, acquaintances, and representatives of the government, there was a strange lack of personal grief. Portstead had been respected and esteemed, not loved, and Mr. Clavering felt, as others did, 
that Elsie Baring's sobs, the only audible sound of grief, were not for the dead man, but for the living. Many were there who asked themselves, where was Robert Sylvester, and why did he not stand by his sister's side at this trying time? Where was he, indeed? Mr. Clavering glanced over at the inexorable Burton and sighed. He knew. When would he rout the poor boy from his refuge? Then Mr. Clavering's gaze rested on Lord Meldrum, sitting with bowed head apart from the others. How was he to save Robert from arrest, as he had assured Lady Ursula that he would? What connection, if any, had he with the death of his political opponent? It came with a pang to Mr. Clavering that he could bear far less to know the handsome, virile, great-hearted Meldrum guilty of this awful crime than the poor weakling Robert Sylvester. In either case, it would break, was breaking, Lady Ursula's heart, and Mr. Clavering, as an old friend of the family, felt deeply for her. He knew what a storm of emotions her calm exterior must hide. Of a loving and passionate nature, though tempered by the cold criticism and rigid discipline of Lord Portstead, under which she had of late years lived, her suffering must have been intense. And Mr. Clavering vowed to himself, as he looked at her beautiful face, beautiful in spite of its pallor and the dark shadows under the weary eyes, that he would do his utmost to prove both Robert and Meldrum, the two idols of her heart, guiltless of even a share in Portstead's death. Yet he had already seen enough of the inner workings of the case to realize that he was setting himself a task more or less after the fashion of Don Quixote when he rode against the windmills. The interment took place in Portstead churchyard, where slumbered generations of bygone Sylvesters. Somewhat to Mr. Clavering's surprise, Lady Ursula requested him, instead of Lord Meldrum, to ride in the carriage with her. As the carriages approached the gates of the churchyard, there was a short halt, and Mr. Clavering, glancing back over the winding hill, Lady Ursula had not been able to endure the curtain drawn, saw distinctly the occupants of the rear carriages, which a curve of the road brought in line with theirs. At the window of one of these he beheld Lord Meldrum. He was looking out over the daisied meadows to the purple crest beyond, and there was a certain grim poise to the handsome blonde head. Meldrum was riding alone. Upon the return to the manor, Harry Brooks was waiting to assist Lady Ursula from the carriage. Her fortitude was at the snapping point. Like most high-strung women, now that the hour of trial for which she had steeled herself was past, collapse was near. But the secretary said something to her in a low voice that brought back to her eyes the indomitable light of endurance. "'Mr. Clavering,' she said, choosing to ignore the arm that Brooks, with respectful solicitude, offered her, I want you to come with me to Robert's room. He has returned. I shall not need you, Mr. Brooks. The secretary bowed politely, but a shadow fell across his face. That is an officious young man, panted Mr. Clavering, striving with his short legs to keep pace with Lady Ursula as she flew up the stairs. Shall you retain him in your service? No, no, impatiently. I shall dismiss him as soon as possible. I have never liked him. Ah, Robert, Robert! She had reached her brother's room, flung wide the door, and stood regarding, with a great pity in her eyes, the dejected, boyish figure sunk in the big armchair by the window. Robert started up at her cry. A moment only she hesitated, and then, running forward, clasped him in her arms, sobbing over him. For the living brother she could weep. "'Robin, Robin,' she sobbed, using her old pet name, "'where have you been all these days?' "'God only knows, Ursula, in hell, I think.' "'Robin, why didn't you come to me before? You must have known how I worried, how I needed you.' Robert raised from his sister's shoulder his pallid, seamed face. Gone from it was all youthfulness, all hope. It was the face of a man, prematurely old, rended and racked by mental agony. "'Ursula, I just couldn't. This thing has stunned me. I think I've been crazed ever since.' I know I was that night. That horrible night, she shuddered, holding him close. And, oh, Robin, your quarrel at the country club. That is known now, and the worst constructions put upon it. But now that you have come back, you will speak and disprove. He pushed her from him, almost roughly. I will say nothing and disprove nothing. Robert, she cried aghast, you must speak. Even if it kills me, you must. Robert caught her fiercely by the shoulders. "'Ursula, 
with a sudden show of manliness. I'm a beastly cad, and a drunkard, and every sort of a worthless devil. But you're my sister, and the only person on earth who has stuck by me, and I'll be damned if I'll speak. Then, Robert Sylvester, she cried passionately, though a great admiration shone in her eyes, I will speak. You shall not. I forbid it. If you do, I'll say that you're lying to save me. That it was I shot Cecil. Oh, they'll believe me fast enough, with an outburst of bitterness. You mean, she demanded, with whiter face now than his, that you will swear it was you shot Cecil? If you open your lips to say a word about the murder, I will, so help me. And if I say nothing? Then I will say nothing, too. But, Robert, she objected despairingly, they will convict you on circumstantial evidence. Let them, he answered with a reckless laugh. Cecil always told me I would hang some day. Lady Ursula turned to Mr. Clavering with a piteous appeal to reason with her brother. At that juncture, Burton, followed by Lord Meldrum and Harry Brooks, entered the room without waiting to knock. You'll be jolly careful what you say, Ursula, cautioned Robert, though some of his defiance gave way to fear at the sight of Burton. I meant what I said. She did not reply, but cast a withering glance upon the secretary. "'So you are working in conjunction with Scotland Yard, Mr. Brooks?' He quivered under her scorn, and she turned with contempt from him to Burton. "'Well, sir, what now? You choose a strange time to torture me with fresh questions, when I have just come from my brother's new-made grave.' Burton's color mounted, but he preserved his usual drawl as he answered, "'I did not come to question your ladyship.' but to give a welcome home to your other brother, Mr. Sylvester. Begging your ladyship's pardon, I should say, Lord Portstead, he corrected himself with obvious intent. Robert went a shade whiter at the suddenness of the new appellation, and Lady Ursula visibly trembled. She was the first to recover herself. Then, sir, she remarked to Burton, since you have performed your self-imposed duty and greeted my brother, Lord Portstead, she spoke the title without faltering, Perhaps you will be good enough to rid us of your presence. Burton resented her scorn. He scowled darkly, and his jaw had more of a bulldog set to it than ever. Certainly, my lady, I can understand that you and Lord Portstead have a good deal to talk over, but I've got something to talk over with his lordship, too. Shall I see your lordship in half an hour in, say, in the library? He shot a sharp glance at Robert as he spoke. Robert's knees shook under him. Not in the library! he exclaimed with horror. Burton smiled. In the music room, then, and he quickly withdrew. Robert, implored Lady Ursula, you will let me speak now? You must. No, he muttered, and averted his face that she might not see the effort it cost him. Robert, she declared with streaming eyes, you are the noblest, bravest, maddest boy I ever knew of. For God's sake, go away and leave me, he cried irritably. Do you want to have me blubbering like a baby? He crossed swiftly to the window, his features twitching. Lady Ursula turned to Lord Meldrum, who had been gravely watching them, and said in a low, piteous tone, Wilford, he has sealed my lips. They will hang him unless... They shall not hang him, Ursula, responded Meldrum in a firm voice. She dropped her face in her hands with a little moan. It seems as though I could not bear this. Lord Meldrum made a movement toward her, but checked himself. "'Dear heart, you must bear it, for Robert's sake. For mine, too,' he added in a whisper. She raised her head with determination. "'You are right, Wilford. I must bear it, and I will. But heaven have pity on me!' She burst forth into sobbing and hastily left the room. Meldrum passed his hand across his eyes, then straightened resolutely. Mr. Clavering wondered how much of all this the glowering little secretary had understood. He was not ordinarily a man of passions, but at that moment, when he saw how malignantly Brooke's eye rested on Meldrum, he would have given much to have soundly thrashed the little secretary. Robert's bravado broke down when his sister had gone. He held out a shaking hand to Meldrum. "'I say, Mel, old chap, you'll stand by me, won't you?' Lord Meldrum gripped his hand encouragingly. You can count on me, my boy. End of chapter 13「Chapter 14 of That Affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Essen Locke. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Portstead's Will Robert came from his interview with Burton, white and shaken, but refused to divulge to his sister what had passed between them. "'Don't you worry, Ursula,' he said with a valiant attempt to reassure her. "'I'm still a free man.' After fortifying himself with several brandy and sodas, he stumbled out upon the western terrace where Lord Meldrum and Mr. Clavering sat smoking in silence. Impersonal conversation had become an impossibility, and Mr. Clavering lacked the moral courage to introduce the subject that he knew lay heavy upon them both. For his part, he was tormented by the constantly recurring questions. What secret knowledge of the murder did Lady Ursula share with Robert? Did it concern Meldrum? Did Robert persist in his silence and hers in order to shield himself or Meldrum or whom? Mr. Clavering looked steadily at Meldrum, and he could not, would not, believe him guilty. Meldrum's eyes were fixed in reflection upon the setting sun. From the gardens below was wafted the sweet fragrance of roses and mignonette, and the only sounds that broke the tranquillity of the sunset hour were the cawing of the rooks in the long avenues of elms and beeches and limes that infiladed the park or the gentle lowing of a cow from the meadowlands beyond. Nature was at peace, if not those in the pilastered old ivy-grown manor. The beauty of the sundown was not lost on Robert Sylvester. "'Mel, old chap,' he began weakly, "'I'm in a deuce of a mess.' Meldrum, recalled from his abstraction, sprang up, and taking the boy by the arm, pushed him into a chair. "'Robert, you have been drinking,' remarked Mr. Clavering severely. Robert's heavy eyes blazed. "'Drinking? Confound it all! Wouldn't you drink if you had your neck in a noose and couldn't get it out?' Meldrum laid a restraining hand on his shoulder. "'Calm down, my boy. It's not as bad as that.' Robert's anger died away in a burst of self-pity. "'I was always the unluckiest dog. The pater never had the ghost of a fatherly feeling for me, and Cecil's sanctimony was enough to drive anyone to the devil. And now I've got to hang for him.' "'You are not going to hang for him, Robert,' said Meldrum gravely. At this, Robert made an effort to pull himself together. "'Look here, Mel. Ursula's been talking to you. I know she has. But don't you believe her. She doesn't know what she's saying. She is half crazed with worry and all that. What did she tell you, anyway?' he demanded excitedly. "'Your sister told me nothing, Robert. Only asked me to save you. And I promised that I would.' There was a new sternness in Meldrum's manner, but Robert did not observe it. "'You can't save me,' he muttered. "'Nobody can.' "'Why, great heavens, Mel!' His flushed face turned ashen. "'It was my pistol that Cecil was shot with. My name on the plate!' "'I did not know that!' exclaimed Meldrum in horror and amazement. "'That's Burton's exhibit number one, said Robert, with a reckless, bitter laugh. "'Oh, he's got me right enough. And you can't save me. And Ursula can't.' "'I shall save you for your sister's sake,' said Meldrum in a sterner voice. Robert glared with peculiar rage at the man who proposed to aid him. "'You keep out of this mess, Lord Meldrum, or all. Well, you'll wish you had, that's all. I'm looking out for my sister, and I won't have any of your bally interference. I've blackened her life long enough, and if I choose to drop out of it—' His weak mouth quivered. "'That's my business, not yours.' With this he flung into the manor. "'Poor wretched boy,' sighed Meldrum. "'He's more than half right, Clavering.' His father and brother were hard on him, beastly hard. At that moment a girlish, white-clad figure hastened toward them from the gardens. "'Mr. Clavering,' called Elsie Baring, tremulously, "'was not that Robert who just went in?' It was Robert. He spoke compassionately. He thought it a pity that this once glad-hearted young girl should be made to suffer through misplaced affection for a graceless scamp. For at best, that was all that Robert was. "'Miss Baring,' said Meldrum persuasively, I think Robert is in need of a little kindness. The world is using him rather hard just now, and a few kind words would mean a good deal to him. Elsie Baring flushed faintly. It was the first time she and Meldrum had met since the morning she had practically accused him of knowing more of the murder than he should. I did not suppose you would speak for Robert, she faltered, and then stopped, conscious of what she had said. Meldrum smiled painfully. Perhaps you have misjudged me, Miss Baring he remarked quietly. She looked up into eyes that met her squarely. "'Perhaps I have. I hope I have,' she added impulsively, and hurried into the manor. Later that evening Lady Ursula came to Mr. Clavering and asked him for a loan of several thousand pounds. "'That man, Belmont, whom—' 
whom robert quarrelled with at the country club she explained shamefacedly and some other leeches indignation made her bitter have sworn at a warrant for robert's immediate arrest unless he can meet his debts to them i cannot help him she said hopelessly mr clavering assured her of his willingness to assist her in any way and forthwith wrote out the check he knew that lady ursula scarcely ever had ready money though the rents from the portstead tenantry should have been adequate and he understood that cecil had made these over to her without reserve at the time he settled the manor upon her he suspected that her father had left her but a mere pittance and he knew that he had practically disowned robert so this must explain the slenderness of her resources from childhood robert had always had the lion's share of her possessions and his drains upon her of late must have been frightful mr clavering had never ceased to blame the old earl for the lack of feeling a sort of refined brutality which he had displayed toward his two younger children both were of a warm-hearted impetuous nature so foreign to his and that of his heir that he was totally unable to understand them so sought to rule them with a rod of iron and failing laid all the fault at their door cecil's will is to be read to-morrow lady ursula was saying i should like you to be present at the reading mr clavering was rather flattered by the way in which she depended on him but he did think it a bit hard on lord meldrum whom she seemed to avoid and who was obviously wounded by it mary gray made herself rather unduly conspicuous that night mr clavering thought she insisted upon making friends with robert and finally drew him from the defiant taciturnity into which he had settled after elsie barron had tried in vain to convince him that she still believed in him she wished to be kind to him to show faith in him but it was easy to read the doubt in her mind and this robert resented mr clavering watched mary gray uneasily as she subtly led robert on to talk of himself his pleasures and pursuits and now again stealing at him strange sly little sidelong glances robert had drank just enough to make him very voluble when once he was started and not particularly discriminating in his choice of topics yet not the faintest flush disturbed the clear pallor of mary gray's cheek as he discoursed of his friends of the turf the demimonde and even described in detail a recent champagne orgy at which he had stood sponsor and the bills for which were unpaid and likely to remain so until he said with his reckless laugh the estate is settled up mary gray simply smiled her pensive smile and encouraged him to talk on i say she's an uncommon jolly young woman by george she is he confided to mr clavering in a burst of enthusiasm as she wished him a smiling good night and glanced back at him from the great staircase with big elusive brown eyes she's a minx a scheming minx admonished mr clavering indignantly old boy robert spoke with the easy authority of a man of the world you don't know a fine piece of women flesh when you see it and laughing in a superior way he went up to bed with blithe unsteadiness of gait in the morning a different mood held him he was dejected irritable and suspicious and vouchsafed no response to mary gray's bright good morning you are right mr clavering he said soberly that girl is an artful puss she was leading me on last night to make a bally ass of myself but what did she do it for eh i didn't say anything about his eyes rolled in fear about tuesday night did i no answered mr clavering severely your conversation was limited to men of evil reputation and women of none at all if you continue to indulge your appetite for drink i dare say that you will place yourself in an even more critical position than you are in now robert turned a sickly white and cast a curious furtive glance about this was becoming a habit of his when he was not sure where burton was you're right mr clavering he said again you may be a bettyfied old fogey but you're right about the drink i daren't trust my tongue after it i swear i'll keep my promise to ursula and not touch another drop lord meldrum who had overheard shook him warmly by the hand do so my boy he said earnestly before it is too late you owe it to your sister she has been good to you i know that mel tears stood in robert's eyes she's the best sister ever a fellow had and so help me i'm going to repay her the will of cecil john sylvester eighth earl of portstead was something of a surprise when read to the little gathering in the library mr clavering felt sure that it was owing to burton's insistence that the reading took place there in order that he might study the effect of the room on robert sylvester the great gloomy library had always been oppressive to robert it was doubly so now 
and Mr. Clavering feared that he would not be able to remain, but he finally pulled himself together and assumed an air of reckless indifference to his surroundings and to Burton's keen, inexorable eyes fastened upon him. Lady Ursula sat beside her brother, her arm resting protectingly about his neck, as though she defied Burton or anyone else to take him from her. Robert seemed to find comfort in her silent championship, and now and then smiled at her feebly. The late Earl of Portstead had been a shrewd businessman, and he left more wealth than Mr. Clavering had dreamed of, but his disposition of it was odd, though consistent with his hard and implacable nature. To Robert, his heir, he bequeathed practically an empty title, since the entailed estates, without the means to keep them up, would yield a very inadequate income. But Portstead had held out a straw of hope to his brother, in a clause which stated that one-third of his personal wealth was to be held in trust until such time as said Robert shall reform his manner of living and become an honorable and upright English gentleman. In the event of his failing to reform, said third of money was to pass to a training school for diplomats in which Lord Portstead had taken interest. Robert emitted a short, bitter laugh as this clause in his brother's will was read. "'By George!' he muttered aloud. "'If that isn't Cecil to the life, strike a chap when he's down.' "'Hush! Oh, hush!' warned Lady Ursula, placing her hand over his mouth and glancing in terror at Burton to see if he had heard. His expression told her that he had. "'Unto my sister, the Lady Ursula Sylvester,' resumed the solicitor, after a shocked look over his gold-rimmed spectacles at Robert, "'I give and bequeath one-third of all personal property, the mansion at Belgrave Square, then followed an enumeration of two country seats, one in Sussex and one in Yorkshire, and of a castle in Scotland, but there were added so many stipulations and restrictions that she would be but nominal mistress of both money and estates. And, read on Sir Frederick Murray, these estates and lands thereunto pertaining are to be held by said Lady Ursula only so long as, here he paused impressively, so long as, and no longer, the said Lady Ursula shall continue to bear and be known by the name of Sylvester. Well, of all the outrageous! burst forth the irrepressible Robert again, but a warning gesture from his sister checked him. She, on the contrary, betrayed neither surprise nor indignation at this peculiar clause in the will, nor, indeed, did she display any emotion other than weary resignation. She apparently did not question her brother's right to dictate to her in death as he had done in life. But why, pondered Mr. Clavering, as he had pondered countless times, why should this high-spirited woman submit so tamely to the petty humiliations and selfish restrictions, for how else could they be considered, of a brother whose nature was so diametrically opposed to hers that there could be between them no bond of affection or even harmony? Yet Mr. Clavering was bound to admit that, however cold and hard, Cecil, Earl of Portstead, might have appeared to the world, he himself believed that he was actuated solely by a high sense of justice and right. With him the emotions had never spoken. His every act was the result of deliberation and was what he conscientiously believed to be right, in accordance with the rigid standard by which he regulated his own life and sought to regulate that of others. Knowing this, Mr. Clavering felt that his opposition to his sister's marriage with Lord Meldrum, an opposition which he had carried beyond the grave, must be founded on more than political enmity. Absorbed as he was in these speculations, he heard only vaguely what disposition was to be made of Lady Ursula's share in the event of her disregarding the will of her dead brother. But the name of the third beneficiary aroused him and set in motion a train of doubts and new theories. I give and bequeath, so read Sir Frederick Murray, unto Mavis Travers, sometime a resident of Teggiano, Italy, and later of Surrey, England, one-third of all personal property, the same to be held in trust, until the said Mavis Travers shall have come of age. Mavis Travers? The oddity of the first name struck Mr. Clavering at once, and conjured up the vision of a red-haired little fury, vigorously belaboring a sweating Shetland pony. Her nurse, the woman Elena, was an Italian. That Mavis and the one named in the will might very likely be one and the same. The identicalness of the first names, the fact that the Mavis he knew was also resident in Surrey, and that her nurse was of Italian nationality, could hardly be mere coincidence. But in any case, in what relation could the Earl of Portstead have stood to this mysterious child whom he had named so conspicuously in his will? 
He, Mr. Clavering, had never heard of her before. He was sure from the amazement on Lady Pevensey's face and on that of the other listeners, including Robert, that they, too, never had. Yet she had met enough to Portstead to be made third beneficiary, and without proviso. Did Lady Ursula know of her existence? He recalled her unwillingness to have mention made of Elena, or even admit her reality, and her subsequent agitation when he told her of the man who had accosted the woman and child. He believed that she knew well enough who Mavis Travers was, and she was so agitated now by this last clause in the will that she demanded that Sir Frederick reread it slowly. When he had finished, she burst into uncontrollable weeping, and Robert had to assist her from the room. Mr. Clavering went alone into the gardens with the name of Mavis Travers ringing in his ears. Who was this child from Teggiano, Italy, whom the Earl of Portstead had made his chief beneficiary, since she alone was hampered by no provisos, and yet of whose existence even the oldest friends of the family were ignorant? End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of That Affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Clavering muddies his boots. It being late afternoon, Mr. Clavering went up to his room, and upon going to the window, his gaze was irresistibly drawn to those dense woods, darkling against the east. His desire to investigate them was returning. He wondered if the man were still lurking there who had accosted Mavis. Mavis Travers. That name was still buzzing through his head, suggesting, always suggesting, something that he could recall or connect with some half-forgotten memory. Looking out thus to the woods, his eye was attracted by the distant figure of a man hastening toward them across the meadows. He recognized at once that tall, powerful form. But why should Lord Meldrum seek the woods in the gathering twilight? The old, unwelcome suspicions came flooding back, and he made up his mind to follow, if he could not overtake him. But by the time Mr. Clavering had issued from the manor and descended the double terrace into the gardens, which he must cross in order to reach the meadows and the woods beyond, Lord Meldrum had passed from sight. To judge by the haste he made, he was bound upon a mission of more importance than a desultory stroll through the woods. Mr. Clavering was quite red in the face from his attempt to overtake him when he finally arrived at the border of the meadows, which, to his dismay, he found to be marshy. But he manfully went forward, although it cost him a pang as his beautifully polished patent leathers slipped in the oozy grass. Lord Meldrum evidently knew well the shortest cut to the woods, but what was Mr. Clavering's surprise, upon emerging from the meadows and entering the shadow of the great trees, to discover that a well-defined path led shortly to a small clearing, beyond which he saw the dim outlines of a rough cottage or woodcutter's abandoned hut. In his excitement and eagerness to reach it, he failed to observe a small morass that lay between it and him, and at the first step forward plunged into the mire halfway up to his knees. With a groan of despair for his ruined elegance, he made frantic efforts to extricate himself, but only succeeded in floundering deeper. At length, really fearing that he would be sucked down by the mire, he raised a long, dismal shout for help. In answer, the figure of Meldrum towered in the doorway of the hut. Mr. Clavering repeated his cry, desperately waving his arms. Otherwise, he did not move. He dared not. Lord Meldrum hurried toward him, keeping to the narrow, grass-grown path that skirted the morass. When he was near enough to recognize the gesticulating little man caught in the grip of the mire, consternation and amusement struggled with each other across his face. "'By Jove, Clavering, my dear fellow, what possessed you to come here?' "'If you will be kind enough to assist me out of this predicament, I will endeavor to explain,' answered Mr. Clavering testily, resenting Meldrum's obvious desire to laugh. "'Forgive me, old chap,' said Meldrum, with an expansive smile. "'But you know you look deuced funny, stuck there in the mire.' "'This is not the time to indulge in humor,' rebuked Mr. Clavering, with rising indignation, and after another fruitless effort to free himself. "'A moment more, and I shall be sucked under.' "'Not the slightest danger of that,' reassured Meldrum, choking down a laugh. "'The bog is not deep enough. But here, wait a minute, and I'll get you out.' Withdrawing into the clearing, he shouldered a stout branch that lay upon the ground, and hurrying back with it, approached as near Mr. Clavering as he could, without being himself drawn into the mire. Holding firmly one end of the branch, he bade Mr. Clavering grasp the other and hold on tight. Then he drove his heels into the turf, exerted all his strength, and Mr. Clavering rose precipitately from the bog. His boots caught. 
slipped upon the soft, wet turf, caught again as Meldrum threw his powerful weight into the scale, and the next moment he fell, clear of the bog, on his hands and knees at the feet of his rescuer. There was a twinkle in Meldrum's eye as he assisted Mr. Clavering to rise, but with praiseworthy gravity he remarked that it was fortunate he had happened to be near at hand. Mr. Clavering was not a profane man, but when he beheld the state of his boots and his once immaculate dark grey trousers and black frock coat, he was obliged to set his teeth. "'I cannot return to the manor in this condition,' he said despairingly. "'But, dear boy, there's no help for it!' And now Meldrum's hearty, ringing laugh awoke an echo in the woods. Indeed, Archibald Clavering, dripping with mire, hatless, disheveled, and with eyes still round with fear, was cause sufficient for mirth. He, however, saw no humour in his predicament, and was highly incensed with Meldrum. Meldrum laid his hand affectionately upon his shoulder. "'Dear old chap, if you could only see yourself!' "'I have no wish to,' snapped Mr. Clavering. "'If you have a trace of friendly feeling for me, you will go at once to the manor and send Jenkins here with a change of clothing.' "'But, Clavering, you mustn't stand here shivering by the edge of the bog,' objected Lord Meldrum. "'I will stand here all night rather than return in this condition,' responded Mr. Clavering obstinately. Lord Meldrum doubtless knew how impossible it was to move him when he had a spell of stubbornness. Yet, as a last expedient, he mentioned that gentleman's favorite bugbear, a severe cold, against which he was always fussily guarding. But Mr. Clavering was obdurate. He would permit no one else, save Jenkins, to behold him in this plight. "'If I feel chilly,' he said, "'I can go into that hut.' "'I wouldn't go in there,' said Meldrum quickly. "'Why not?' suspiciously. "'You were there.' Dark as it had grown, he fancied that he could see Lord Meldrum flush at this assertion. "'Oh, I er, just looked in,' he answered, with an attempt at nonchalance. "'It's a bare place. You wouldn't find it attractive.' "'I do not find this bog attractive,' retorted Mr. Clavering, determined now to explore the hut. "'But you know, old chap,' opposed Meldrum, "'somebody may be living in that hut, after all, and if he should come back and find you there, there might be trouble.' Mr. Clavering felt himself grow cold, but it took hardly less courage on his part to risk being seen by Lady Pevensey in such a plight as this, than face a potential inhabitant of the woodcutter's hut. Moreover, his detective zeal was aroused. "'I shall remain here,' he said resolutely. Lord Meldrum turned away with a resigned shrug. Instantly Mr. Clavering felt his courage wanning. "'I say, Meldrum!' he called after him desperately. "'You haven't a—a a weapon of any sort, have you?' Meldrum came quickly back to where Mr. Clavering stood, drew a revolver from his hip pocket, and handed it to him. "'You don't know much about firearms, Clavering, so don't play with the trigger. It might go off. If you should see anyone prowling about here, don't lose your head. I will be back as soon as I can. By the way, Clavering, with abrupt directness, how had you happened to come here?' Mr. Clavering hesitated. Prevarication had grown no easier for him in the course of his detective work. "'From my window I saw you making across the meadow,' he replied finally. "'I felt like a stroll in the woods myself, so I attempted to overtake and, uh, join you.' "'Sorry you didn't mention your desire at luncheon,' remarked Lord Meldrum dryly. "'It might have saved you a dip in the mire, and would have given me a companion. "'Well, look out for yourself, old chap. I shan't be long.' Left there with the dark woods encircling him, Mr. Clavering placed the revolver with great care in his own pocket, and thereupon breathed easier. He was not accustomed to firearms, and had almost a womanish fear of them. Looking down upon the morass which showed now as a black patch in the darkness, he knew well where Meldrum had gained the boggy mud that caked his shoes on the night on which Lady Pevensey's necklace was stolen, and he had professed to have walked from the railway station along a dry and dusty road. As always, he recalled with a shock how Mary Grey had gathered particles of similar mire from the library floor on the night of Lord Portstead's death. But she, too, judging from the condition of her boots and skirts, must have crossed the bog herself that morning when she claimed to have gone into the woods to gather ferns. What was the object of her prying interest in the case? Blackmail? He was convinced that she was a Becky Sharp. But Meldrum! If Burton knew of this incriminating evidence against him, added to his own admission of having gone into the gardens after his interview with Portstead, instead of going up to his room, the detective could not but abandon his persecution of Robert and arrest Meldrum. The fact that Portstead was killed with his brother's pistol by no means proved conclusively that it was Robert who had fired the shot. Mr. Clavering writhed in mental agony. Meldrum, though nearly twenty years younger than he, was his one intimate friend, 
and had been so since the time he was a big, overgrown, fun-loving boy at Eton, and Mr. Clavering had been appointed his guardian, jointly with his widowed mother. Mr. Clavering was not of the nature to make friends readily with other men. To begin with, he had no interest in sports, that magic bond of union between Englishmen, and though he belonged to several select clubs, he had become a member rather because he believed it the correct thing for a gentleman of his standing to do than from any spirit of good fellowship. As a boy at school, his almost womanish prudishness and precision of dress had made him a butt for ridicule, and as a man these characteristics, combined with a pompous stiffness of manner, alienated many and caused others to hold him in a sort of tolerant contempt, as a Betty and old fogey. But Meldrum, with the frank heartiness which endeared him to all who knew him, with the striking exception of the Earl of Portstead, broke through this prim reserve and pomposity, found the true man, sensitive, conscientious, and kindly, and forthwith began with him a warm friendship. Mr. Clavering, on his part, regarded the jovial, virile Meldrum with a species of mild adoration, and in no event could he or would he voice the suspicions he had been forced to hold of him. If he had killed Lord Portstead, it must have been done under strong provocation in a moment of passion, and if he were the great-hearted man Mr. Clavering believed him to be, he would not allow the brother of the woman he loved to suffer for him. His own words proved that he intended to save the boy, and, at the same time, they might be taken as self-incriminating. Mr. Clavering decided that in any case he could do no more than let matters drift to a crisis, in the meantime gathering secretly whatever clues he could, for it might be that Lord Meldrum was as much a victim of circumstantial evidence as Robert appeared to be. As a beginning, he would explore the hut which Meldrum had evidently come to visit. As he approached it, he became aware how very black and ominously still the woods were, so still that the sudden strident screech of an owl sent him shivering with vague terror. The great trees arching over the cottage seemed to reach out menacing arms toward him, but when he turned and would have fled from them, the fear of falling again into the quagmire sent him shivering to the very door of the hut. And now the shadows all about seemed to be filled with eerie sounds which in his nervous fear he could not identify, and he sprang into the cottage as into a refuge, one hand on his hip pocket bulging with Meldrum's revolver, the other grasping his silver-topped cane which had been rescued from the bog, and with which he was now striking at the blackness in the room. Presently, however, convinced that no immediate danger threatened him, he laid down his cane and lighted a match. Before it flickered out he had time to observe that the door had fallen from its hinges, the one window was broken, and that there was no one but himself in the room. A second match revealed a rough table in a corner, and on it a half-burned candle. After several failures he succeeded in lighting the candle, and immediately felt more courageous as the darkness became dissipated. The room he was in was a very small one, and devoid of all furniture save the table. A stout partition with a door midway led into a second room. He entered this with no little trepidation, but found it empty as the first. The sight of a square trapdoor in the boarded ceiling, with a rudely constructed ladder hanging underneath against the wall, gave him an unpleasant start. But he made up his mind that if he were to remain in this hut until Meldrum's return, he must discover whether or not he was alone in it. So, raising his cane, he rapped smartly upon the trapdoor, though his heart quaked. There was no response, only the sighing of the wind through the trees outside. Emboldened, he lifted down the ladder, and mounting with some difficulty, not being accustomed to ladder climbing, cautiously raised the trap. Holding the candle above his head, he surveyed a small, low garret. It was empty, but in one corner was a bundle of hay, which had clearly served as a bed, for on it was a pair of blankets, of excellent make, as he discovered upon closer inspection. Poking about in the hay for clues to the identity of the owner, he found a false black beard. That was all, but it was sufficient to convince him of what he had already suspected, that the recent occupant of the hut was the same man who had accosted Mavis and her nurse, Elena. Moreover, the man was likely to return, and Mr. Clavering had no desire to be caught by him like a rat in a trap, so he descended more quickly than he had come up, closed the door, and hung up the ladder as he had found it. He then went into the front room, thinking it the safest place in which to await Meldrum, for whose speedy coming he devoutly prayed. Having set the candle in a convenient notch in the table, he was about to take up his station in the doorway, with cane in one hand and revolver in the other, 
when a snapping of twigs caused him to glance in alarm toward the window. There he saw a man peering in at him, his face pressed against the broken pane, a thin, dark face, stamped and seared with evil. Almost instantly, as Mr. Clavering looked, the man dodged back into the shadows, but in that one brief glimpse he knew him. He was Thompson, Lady Ursula's former butler. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of That Affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Game of Piquet Mr. Clavering passed a bad half-hour in the front room of the cottage, anticipating Thompson's entrance. At length the blackness outside and the silence, broken only by weird wood noises, so wrought upon his nerves that he resolved to face the terrors of the bog and even Lady Pevensey's raillery rather than remain there alone another moment. But when he stepped outside, leaving the candle burning upon the table in case he should change his mind and retreat, the shadows seemed to press in upon him, and from them he fancied he could see emerging a thin, evil face. "'Meldrum!' he cried despairingly. "'Meldrum!' "'What's up, Clavering? Anything wrong?' called back a familiar, welcome voice, and Lord Meldrum strode out from the trees and hurriedly crossed the clearing." Mr. Clavering's terror vanished at the clasp of Meldrum's firm hand, and he despised himself for a coward. "'I thought I heard you coming,' he said lamely. Meldrum glanced in at the open door of the hut, where the candle glowed feebly. "'So you have been exploring,' he exclaimed, and his voice held a curious note. "'What did you come upon that upset you so, eh?' Uh, "'Upset me so?' stammered Mr. Clavering. I, "'I was not aware—' "'You look as though you had seen a ghost,' said Meldrum briefly. "'But come,' leading the way into the hut. "'Let me help you into your clothes. "'I didn't bother to bring Jenkins.' "'Meldrum,' said Mr. Clavering, "'while his lordship, with well-meaning awkwardness, "'was attempting to play the part of valet, "'I have found out who lives in this hut.' "'Lord Meldrum twisted a button off the waistcoat "'he was fastening over Mr. Clavering's plump chest "'and muttered an apology. "'Ah, you have. Who is it, old chap?' "'Thompson,' in an accusing tone. "'Thompson?' echoed Meldrum vaguely. "'Yes, Thompson,' repeated Mr. Clavering severely. "'Lady Ursula's butler, who left her on the day Lady Pevensey's necklace was stolen.' Lord Meldrum hurried Mr. Clavering into his swallowtail. "'Oh, yes, Thompson, I remember now. But how do you know that he has been living here?' "'I saw him looking in at the window.' "'But that doesn't prove—' "'It proves it to my satisfaction,' replied Mr. Clavering with finality. "'Meldrum,' he asserted, going straight to the point, "'you came here to meet this man.' Meldrum's face in the candlelight showed consternation, but he recovered himself after a moment. "'My dear fellow, to meet Thompson the butler?' "'To meet the man calling himself Thompson the butler. Look here, Clavering, what do you mean by all this?' There was a hint of anger in Meldrum's voice. But Mr. Clavering, once started, would not be daunted. "'Who is this man, Meldrum? I know I have seen him before, and I am equally sure he was no butler then.' Meldrum suddenly placed both hands on Mr. Clavering's shoulders, and looked him straight in the eye. "'Clavering, you are a pretty good detective, after all, but you are up against a blind wall this time. I did come to see Thompson, who is not Thompson, as you have guessed, but why I came and who he is, neither you nor all of Scotland Yard combined will ever make me tell.' "'But don't you see,' persisted Mr. Clavering, "'that if it came to be known that you were connected in any way with a man whose very face reveals his evil character, and who dares not live in the open, you would place yourself under suspicion?' "'I see that perfectly well,' replied Meldrum, unmoved. "'And you are quite right in your estimate of this man's character. He is a scoundrelly blackguard, an unhung devil,' he added, with a depth of passion that startled Mr. Clavering. "'Come,' he said, struggling to control himself. "'Let us return to the manor.' In silence they pursued their way through the woods and across the meadows. Arrived in the gardens, Meldrum remarked with a certain boyish wistfulness, "'I should hate to think that all this might break up our friendship, Clavering.' "'It shan't,' declared Mr. Clavering promptly. "'I refuse to believe that you, or Robert either, for that matter, were concerned in Lord Portstead's death, and I am going to do my best to prove this.' "'You have set yourself a task, old friend,' sighed Meldrum. They were met upon the terrace by Lady Pevensey, who playfully scolded them for being late to dinner. Mr. Clavering blessed his good fortune, and having had opportunity to change his miry clothes, which, by the way, Lord Meldrum was carrying— Lady Pevensey had been unusually gracious to Mr. Clavering since the recovery of her necklace, 
which she felt was in no small measure due to his efforts. He had been careful to foster this impression. She was still so jubilant over its recovery that the mystery of its theft and inexplicable return troubled her but little. In truth, far less than it did Burton, who evidently saw a close connection between the theft and the murder. "'I am shockingly bored,' she complained to Mr. Clavering, as Lord Meldrum quietly slipped into the manor before she could question him concerning the miry clothes. "'Ursula is completely absorbed in Robert, and Elsie is about as cheerful as an image on a tombstone. Do you think, after you have had dinner, that there would be any harm in a quiet little game of piquet?' Mr. Clavering had private misgivings as to its propriety on the very day following their host's funeral, but to be invited by Lady Pevensey to play piquet was an appreciated and increasingly rare favour, so he assured her that he thought there would be no real harm in it, though it might be considered unconventional, and promised not to be long at dinner. It had often struck him as odd that Lady Pevensey never asked or seemed to expect Mary Grey, her companion, to amuse her. As a matter of fact, they were scarcely ever seen together, Mary Grey being everywhere but with her patroness. Still, he felt that he should be the last one in the world to reprehend, as it gave him added opportunities to enjoy Lady Pevensey's society. "'This seems like old times,' she observed sentimentally, as they sat down later in the music-room, with a little square card-table between them. "'Poor dear Eustace was fairly jealous of our games of piquet.' "'Really, is that a fact?' murmured Mr. Clavering, surprised. He had always held the opinion that the departed Eustace was singularly unappreciative of his wife's charms, and utterly indifferent as to her diversions. "'Oh, Eustace was shrewd. He saw a great deal more than you thought he did, and Lady Pevensey shook her fan at him with coquettish reproof. He blushed painfully. "'I was not aware that my, uh, attachment, my eminently respectful attachment, was known to Sir Eustace.' Lady Pevensey made a grimace behind her fan. "'Dear Eustace was not greatly worried. On the whole he was amused. Carte blanche!' she cried triumphantly, holding up her cards. "'Score me ten, Mr. Clavering!' He stiffly obeyed. "'Now you are offended with me,' she said pettishly. "'Oh, yes, you are,' as he denied the imputation. "'But really you have made me admire your detective powers. I am sure that the wretch who stole my necklace would never have returned it if he hadn't known that you were on his clue and would have ultimately forced him to. "'That may be so,' conceded Mr. Clavering, relaxing. "'It is your play, Lady Pevensey.' "'Repique,' she murmured absently. "'But that is impossible,' expostulated Mr. Clavering. "'You have just had carte blanche.' Lady Pevensey flung down her cards. "'Oh, well, I am tired of piquet. Count my hand, if you wish.' "'I thought we were going to have an enjoyable game,' remarked Mr. Clavering frigidly. Lady Pevensey made eyes at him over her fan. "'Don't be a grouch, you old dear.' To tell the truth, ever since the will was read, I have been simply consumed with curiosity to know who Mavis Travers is. Robert admits that he doesn't know. I think Ursula does, but I don't dare ask her. You know what she is when she doesn't want to talk. Find out for me, and I'll play piquet with you till the end of time, Archibald. Mr. Clavering unbent again. She had never called him Archibald before. I don't think it would be improper, under the circumstances, the publicity given the child in the will— for me to make a few inquiries, he said slowly, trying to convince himself of the integrity of his motives. He decided, however, that it would be fairer to make no mention of the Mavis he had met until he was sure of her identity. Lady Pevensey caught him up quickly. Improper? Quite the reverse, I should say. Are not you and I both old friends of the family? And isn't it our duty as such to find out about this child, who met so much to Portstead that he left the money he should have left to Robert? why now that you put it that way there's no other way to put it i always suspected that there was some secret in portstead's life i am convinced of it now and this child was the secret why is it that none of us has ever heard of her before i tell you it is unnatural and impossible for a man to be as indifferent all his life to women as portstead professed to be there was a personal rancor in lady pevensey's tone the earl had been at no pains to conceal the contempt he felt for her worldliness "'My dear Lady Pevensey,' ejaculated Mr. Clavering, horrified, "'what are you hinting at?' "'Scandal in high circles, of course,' she answered serenely. "'But what I can't understand is how any woman, of any condition in life, could possibly have been attracted to Portstead.' Little as Mr. Clavering had cared for Portstead, the vulgarity of Lady Pevensey's suspicions pained him. He had always accepted Portstead at his own valuation, 
and secretly looked up to him as a superior being and now to have this idol suddenly pulled down to the common level was a decided shock no no he said but weakly i am sure that you are wrong in your suspicions women's intuition rarely fails mine never does returned lady pevensey confidently find out the parentage of this mavis travers and who will be the gainer even indirectly by her being named as portstead's beneficiary and it is my belief you will find the murderer mr clavering stared at her in admiration lady pevensey you are an immensely clever woman he said with conviction flatterer she protested with a flirt of her fan upon my word i mean it lady pevensey toyed a while coquettishly with the fan and then said seriously elsie is breaking her heart over that scapegrace of a robert and i'm rather attached to the silly girl no man is worth breaking one's heart over and if somebody doesn't discover the murderer that burton man will have robert arrested and then elsie will mourn herself sick you are as likely to succeed as any one i have come to the conclusion that all detectives are fools mr clavering remained a moment in thought this was the second time lady pevensey had paid him an equivocal compliment of this nature am i to understand he inquired at length that you consider me qualified to investigate this matter lady pevensey gave vent to a ripple of very youthful laughter my dear archibald don't you know a compliment when one is paid you remember if you unravel this shocking mystery she used her eyes and her fan as she might have used them thirty years ago i am yours for piquet end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of that affair at portstead manor by gladys etzen lock this librivox recording is in the public domain mr clavering visits wild rose villa the next day being sunday mr clavering did not deem a proper one for attempting to solve the mystery of mavis travers identity but on monday morning directly after breakfast he set forth on this quest in obedience to lady pevensey's wishes as a preliminary he asked that fund of ready information the head gardener where a wild rose villa was situated the gardener removed his broad hat and scratched his head contemplatively never heard of it sir he said finally and i've lived in this ere village for sixty year this was not encouraging but mr clavering would not be turned from his purpose not wishing to be hampered by the attendance of an inquisitive groom he decided to walk to the village by the time however that he had traversed the three-mile avenue from the manor to the lodge gates he wished that he had accepted the trap which lady ursula had placed at his disposal he had never had a predilection for walking and the day with the blue haze of midsummer lying over the church spires and the gabled roofs of the village of portstead bade fair to be hot with a sigh he resisted the temptation to sit a while and rest in the cool ivy-grown lodge and instead descended the high hill into the village along a picturesque lane winding between copses of pine and larch with glimpses of green meadows and the heather-clad downs the air was sweet with the new-mown hay and in the distance were groups of reapers quaint figures in smock frocks and wide-brimmed straw hats hot and weary as mr clavering was he was made to feel the pastoral charm of portstead village the long and straggling lane flanked by hawthorn hedges which boasted the proud title of high street led past curious old thatched cottages a tiny creeper-covered church and finally to the school a low half-timbered structure through the open windows of which he saw rows of comic rustic heads beyond to the right lay the village hostelry a queer rambling old place with a mighty sign lazily creaking above the door here at the inn he stopped and inquired the way to wild rose villa but the landlord knew no more about it than did the gardener mr clavering felt wholly unequal to searching the entire village so bluntly told the landlord that wild rose villa was the dwelling of a child named mavis travers of whom he must surely know a ray of intelligence lighted up the landlord's bucolic countenance i don't know the name sir but do little miss have red hair and a pony that she drives maynard mr clavering assured him that she possessed both these qualifications ah eh, then sir i know where she lives they do say sir little miss is an i italian he looked to mr clavering for verification indeed murmured the gentleman uncommunicatively 
"'I trust it is not far to Wild Rose Villa?' The landlord swallowed his disappointment at Mr. Clavering's brevity of manner. "'No, sir. Tis not far, if that's how the cottage is called. Turn down the first street to the left. Little Miss lives in the third cottage, facing the west. You'll see her at the window, sir. When she's not driving the pony, she's sure to be sitting there. The woman who has charge of her don't let the children play with her, but they runs after her in the pony cart. And locks, sir, if they gets in the way, she don't mind running them down. She's a wild one, little Miss is. From the loquacious landlord, Mr. Clavering learned further that Mavis had been in the village but a very short time. Wild Rose Villa, never before dignified by any distinguishing appellation, had stood vacant over a year until its present tenants moved in. But where they came from, and the hour and manner of their arrival, was a mystery. Even Mrs. Jones, the observant neighbor opposite, had not been aware that the cottage was tenanted until, as early as seven o'clock on the morning of the second day after the Earl's murder, the landlord was very exact as to the date, she had beheld Mavis sitting at the window. The child and her foreign nurse, then, must either have arrived at sunrise or in the storm the night before. That afternoon Mrs. Jones's youngest baby was rescued from under the very hoofs of the Shetland pony. And now, said the landlord in conclusion, when that red-haired little wildcat goes a-flying through the village, the babies and old folks are kept indoors. Mr. Clavering, following the landlord's directions, continued along High Street, and turning down the lane to the left, came presently to a small cottage with red-tiled roof and whitewashed walls, bowered and wreathed in roses, even to the pointed gable over which these bright flowers of England poured in cascades. The garden and the little gate, too, were fairly overrun with roses. In the wildest profusion they grew, red, pink, white, and yellow, anywhere, everywhere about the cottage wild rose villa it was in truth at one of the tiny latticed windows curtained with roses and honeysuckle mr clavering beheld the ruddy gold hair and elfish face of mavis she knew him instantly and nodding and smiling beckoned him in with imperious little hand he unlatched the gate and pushed his way through the tangle of roses in some embarrassment what was he to say to this child how was he to question her Elena received him frowningly in the porch doorway and seemed determined to bar his entrance. "'Stand away, Elena. I will have him come in,' cried Mavis with shrill anger. Elena obeyed, but there was a fierce hostility in her great black eyes. She stood with one hand in the bosom of her blouse and the other clenched at her side while Mr. Clavering made some confused inquiries in regard to the pony. "'Oh,' answered Mavis with a toss of her bright hair, I make Tony run faster every day, just to see Elena get cross and the stupid village people stare. That amuses me. Some day you will be thrown out, said Mr. Clavering disapprovingly. That I tell the signorina, but she will not listen, spoke up Elena, eyeing Mr. Clavering with a slightly lessening hostility. Be still, tiresome Elena, cried the child. I will drive Tony as fast as I wish to and talk to everybody I wish to, and do everything I wish to. Mr. Clavering expected to see Elena's temper fly, but instead she went over to the child and caressed her with murmured words of endearment in Italian. Mavis pushed her away petulantly. I don't love you, horrid Elena. You won't let me do anything, but just sit here and sit here, and that's stupid, and I don't love you. How can you talk to the faithful Elena, who has watch and tend you all the days of your life? asked the woman reproachfully. Mavis tilted her pointed little chin in the air. "'Bring me a seed-cake,' she demanded. Elena cast a doubtful look at Mr. Clavering, hesitated, and then hurriedly left the room. As soon as the child saw that they were alone together, she bent toward her visitor, and fixing on him her sharp, bird-like eyes, demanded in a shrill whisper, "'Who died at the manor?' Mr. Clavering started, and was dumb with surprise. "'Quick, tell me!' insisted the child impatiently. Elena won't. She says nobody died, but she tells me lies. I saw the funeral carriages winding down the hill from the manor. I saw them from this window. Look! Mr. Clavering's eye followed her pointing finger and beheld the distant turrets of Portstead Manor, rearing themselves above the low roofs of thatch and tile. It gave him a peculiar sensation to realize that under the very shadow of the hoary old manor, this child, so strangely linked to its dead master, had sat curiously watching the passage of his funeral, and not known whose it was. 
Her intense interest in the manor had dispelled the slightest doubt he had felt as to her being the identical Mavis named in the will. But why had the Earl's death been kept from her? Was Lady Pevensey's suspicion correct? "'Who died at the manor?' broke in Mavis, with sharper insistence. Mr. Clavering shifted uneasily. How was he to answer? There might be some cogent reason for her being kept in ignorance of the Earl's death. In the midst of his puzzlement, Elena hastily returned. Her glance, as it flashed from the impatiently waiting child to Mr. Clavering's perplexed countenance, was accurately distrustful. She went quickly to Mavis. "'The seed-cake, signorina,' she said. Mavis struck it from her hand. "'I don't want the nasty seed-cake. Go away!' She turned then upon Mr. Clavering like the little fury that she was. "'Stupid, stupid man!' she cried, and much more in rapid, angry Italian. Elena's black eyes, too, blazed upon the unhappy visitor. "'You come here to spy? What you tell the signorina? What?' Mr. Clavering backed toward the door. He never cared to face an angry woman, and this one was a perfect virago. "'Spy!' she hissed, pushing him to the threshold. "'You think poor Elena a fool, but she knows you, and she knows that other, the sleek, smiling woman. She send you here, but you tell her you learn nothing from Elena, and she will never let you speak more to the signorina.' At this the little fury by the window screamed out, "'I will speak to him if I wish to, nasty, hateful Elena!' Elena flung wide the outer door. "'Go, signor!' she cried, her face livid with rage. And Mr. Clavering went precipitately. As he turned into the lane, he had a final vision of the child in the window, her red hair flying about her shrewish little face, and her eyes flaming and defiant. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of That Affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Cross Purposes. Did you enjoy your call at Wild Rose Villa, Mr. Clavering? queried a notably sweet voice that made him turn in surprise. Mary Gray was crossing the lane toward him, having apparently come from Mrs. Jones's cottage opposite. The curious smile that curved her lips aroused the antagonism which he always felt in her presence. "'You have done me the honour, then, to follow me?' he demanded stiffly. She shook her head, and her smile widened. "'No, indeed. I was on my way to the village, while you and Lady Pevensey were at breakfast. But I knew that you would go to the villa.' Mr. Clavering's annoyance grew. He was not pleased that Lady Pevensey should discuss him with this assertive and ubiquitous young woman as she had evidently done. "'Miss Gray,' he said, striving to speak with a dignity that should put the young woman in her proper place, "'you appear to me to take an extraordinary interest, I may say a morbid interest, in this whole sad affair.' "'I know that my interest must appear extraordinary to you,' she admitted frankly, "'but, Mr. Clavering, I am a keen student of human nature. Mankind to me is the most fascinating of studies. I never tire of it, and every day I learn more.' In this case, for instance, I find the most elemental types, the most elemental passions. Her frankness was disarming Mr. Clavering in spite of himself. He walked more slowly, at a pace better adapted for conversation. "'What elemental passions have you observed in your study of this case?' he condescended to ask. "'Love, passionate and unreasoning, and hatred as passionate and even more unreasoning,' she answered with conviction. These, I feel sure, were the motive powers that sent the Earl of Portstead from this life. Mr. Clavering had never heard her speak so seriously before, and he was impressed. Perhaps he had done her an injustice. There was nothing about her now to suggest the adventurous. Still, you don't quite trust me yet, Mr. Clavering, she surmised, with an intuitive flash of her brown eyes. I cannot understand you, he confessed. No one does. "'I am a very much misunderstood person,' she said, with a little moo and a reproachful sidelong glance from under her lashes. Mr. Clavering found himself yielding to the subtle charm that he had long recognized in her, but had been unwilling to admit. Resolved to conquer this weakness, he abruptly shifted the subject by asking if she had ever called at Wild Rose Villa. "'Guilty,' she conceded, with a smile of reminiscence. "'And I was ordered out just as you were.' An enfant terrible, the little Mavis. But interesting, 
she added thoughtfully. And as for Elena, oof, she's a tigress. There's no taming her. It came to Mr. Clavering then whom Elena had meant by the sleek and smiling woman. The description was not inapt as applied to Mary Gray. What passions do you think actuate Elena? he asked, curious to see what she would answer. Mary Gray's expression became enigmatic. I really shouldn't care to say, just yet. But when she showed me to the door, I thought it prudent to go. You know, with a twinkle in her eye, what they say about a live coward, Mr. Clavering. Yes, he knew, and he half suspected that she was poking fun at him in her soft, sly way. How did you know about this Mavis Travis and where she lived? he asked in a hostile tone. Mary Gray looked at him ingenuously. Lord Portstead's will was such an interesting document, really illuminating. Lady Pevensey told me all about it, and I had an irresistible desire to see the principal beneficiary. Mr. Clavering viewed her with the old distrust. He had found the will anything but illuminating, and he resolved to advise Lady Pevensey not to make a confidant of Mary Gray. I met our little friend Mavis quite by accident and in a very unique fashion, that young woman rattled on artlessly. I was crossing High Street very leisurely and not thinking at all what I was about, when the Shetland pony dashed around a corner and was on me in a moment. I tried to run, but my skirt was made so ridiculously tight, she glanced down reproachfully at the pretty, clinging grey voile in which she looked so slim and girlish, that I tripped and fell, most ungracefully, I fear, directly in front of the pony. "'Strange that he did not run you over,' remarked Mr. Clavering unsympathetically. His private belief was that she had planned the whole affair. Mary Gray permitted herself a little sigh of self-pity. "'He would have if Elena had not seized the reins and pulled him back on his haunches. That gave me an opportunity to pick myself up. I dare say I looked rather funny, for Mavis was highly amused.' "'Was Elena?' coldly demanded Mr. Clavering. "'No, and just as unconcerned over whether I was hurt or not as you are, Mr. Clavering.' she flashed at him with an arch smile. He was growing extremely nettled, and mainly at himself because he did find this impertinent young woman attractive. He thought it best to ignore her coquettish little thrust, and they walked on in silence. She was the first to speak. I made friends with Mavis on the spot. The little elf interested me. It may seem strange to you, Mr. Clavering, with another fleeting glance from under her lashes, but she did not distrust me. She evidently took a fancy to me, for she invited me to ride in the back of the pony cart. Of course, Elena objected, and quite rudely, but I did not allow that to prevent my ride. No, I should suppose not, observed Mr. Clavering sarcastically. His sarcasm was apparently lost on Mary Gray. Never did I have such a ride, she laughed softly at the recollection. If my teeth had been false, they would surely have been shaken out. I found Mavis a most amusing little witch and we became such friends that she invited me to lunch, and I dared to accept, in spite of Elena. But while we were munching seed-cakes, they seemed to be the child's principal diet, I inadvertently and most innocently made some mention of the manor, whereupon Elena fell upon me like a fury, and I speedily found myself in the lane. I fear I am not a very courageous person, she sighed, for I have never ventured to face the formidable Elena again. I presume that the woman who lives opposite is not so formidable nor so uncommunicative, he could not refrain from remarking. Mary Gray gave another soft little laugh in which there was no trace of rancor. Mr. Clavering, you are positively delightful. You are frankness itself, and I verily believe you have twice the intuition of our friend Burton. Mr. Clavering could not prevent a flush of gratification, although he tried to appear indifferent. "'Do you know of any vehicle we could engage to carry us back to the manor?' he asked, in the blandest tone in which he had ever addressed her. They had come now to the inn, and the long walk back to the manor in the heat of the day seemed to him a Herculean feat. Mary Gray undertook to inquire for some means of conveyance, and being a persuasive and persistent young woman, induced the landlord to harness his own horse and drive them to the manor. As soon as Lady Pevensey had opportunity, she asked Mr. Clavering what success he had had, and upon learning how the child's nurse had received him, was more than ever convinced of the correctness of her suspicions. Burton was still about the house, the inevitable notebook in hand, now questioning the servants, now bullying Robert. 
he was getting his final report ready for the inquest on the morrow. Lady Ursula stood in visible dread of the inquest, and grew more apprehensive as the day approached. There was still a curious aloofness in her manner toward Meldrum, and yet Mr. Clavering would often find her gazing at him with a yearning intensity. It was as though she were forcing herself to crush her love, and it would not be crushed. Meldrum, obviously pained by her coldness, no longer sought her society, but kept much to himself, and it was to Robert that Lady Ursula clung in these hours of suspense. A change had come over Robert in the past two days. He had not tasted liquor in that time, and there was less of the boy and more of the man about him. His attitude toward his sister had altered, too. Formerly it was she who had sustained him. Now he appeared the stronger, and his manner toward her was both affectionate and protective. It would seem that in acquiring his brother's title he had acquired something, too, of his dignity and strength. "'Robert has in him the makings of a man,' observed Lord Meldrum thoughtfully, as he and Mr. Clavering stood out upon the terrace that night, watching the moon rise. "'He only needs a chance, poor boy.' Mr. Clavering was puffing nervously at his cigar. "'What do you think will be the outcome of the inquest?' "'I think,' Meldrum answered with deliberation, "'that there will be an indictment. Burton's heart is set upon it. He intends to distinguish himself in a prominent case like this.' Mr. Clavering flung away his cigar. He had lost all appetite for it. "'You mean that Robert will be indicted?' The moonlight shone softly on Meldrum's grave, calm face. "'Not necessarily, Robert. Haven't you yourself said there is pretty black evidence against me?' "'I said so, but nothing will convince me that you are guilty.' Meldrum clasped his hand warmly. "'Thank you, old chap.' Mr. Clavering looked away, ashamed of the suspicions he had once harbored. "'Meldrum,' he said contritely, "'I confess that at first I, I did have doubts, but they were unworthy of us both, knowing you as I do.' Yet I must say that your conduct is inexplicable in many ways, and to a stranger must appear suspicious. I believe that you either know or suspect who the guilty person is, and it is your duty to yourself to denounce him, no matter who must be the sufferer. No matter who must be the sufferer, repeated Meldrum slowly. That conviction may be righteous, Clavering, but it is piteously hard. Is it any harder than for you to place your life in jeopardy for the sake of shielding some unworthy person? demanded Mr. Clavering indignantly. "'Go slow, old fellow,' said Meldrum affectionately. "'I am not of the stuff that martyrs are made, and if I keep silent about certain matters and tell bungling lies about others, it is not to shield an unworthy person, but because I find it the best and only thing under the circumstances to do.' Mr. Clavering began to feel provoked at his lordship's perversity. "'I am afraid such a plea would do more to convince a jury of your guilt than of your innocence.' he said testily. "'I am afraid it would myself,' Meldrum answered soberly, "'especially when added to Harry Brooke's testimony. He is determined to prove me guilty of the theft of those papers, at least. The fact is, Clavering, my constituents would have been hard-pressed if those measures of Portstead's had reached the house before we were prepared to resist them. I certainly had provocation enough to steal them.' "'But you did not steal them,' asserted Mr. Clavering." Meldrum stared out over the moonlit gardens. "'Somebody did, old chap, and I am the only one here who could have had any possible interest in doing so. Brooke's reasoning is sound.'" End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of That Affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain thrust and parry the inquest was held in the hall of the school that building being the largest and only modern one in portstead village and it was of course crowded to its utmost capacity by curious villagers and sensation-seeking strangers from the city and the neighbouring hamlets it was indeed an incongruous assemblage where men and women of fashion and title avid to behold as a break in the boredom of their lives the harrowing spectacle of those of their own class bearers of an ancient name, pilloried before the mob, jostled elbows and pushed and fought for seats with gaping yokels and the usual morbid throng of idlers who follow up every inquest that bids fair to be sensational. The case had aroused widespread interest owing to the prominence of the murdered man and the publicity given it by the newspapers, 
which latterly had been hinting broadly of the probable implication in the murder of a certain member of the deceased earl's family while robert's name had not been definitely mentioned it had been so glaringly suggested that the public had already mentally tried and condemned him robert upon entering the hall seemed to become aware of this hostile attitude toward him for he at once assumed his old reckless air of defiance which brought upon him the coroner's frown and the greater prejudice of the spectators he flung himself down with studied nonchalance between his sister and elsie baring and proceeded to stare out of countenance any curious person who looked his way lady ursula realized the bad impression he was creating and sought in vain to make him lower his coolly insolent gaze but although in driving over to the village he had shown her the greatest consideration he was now doggedly intractable elsie baring plucked once or twice warningly at his sleeve but desisted when she saw that it only made him angry lady ursula had guarded against the stares of the curious by enveloping her face in a thick black veil which successfully concealed her features the apprehensiveness which she had evinced in the hours before the inquest was no longer apparent she had evidently steeled herself to composure and sat with a quiet dignity exquisitely dressed as always her black gloved hands lightly folded in her lap she paid no heed to the ostentatious half patronizing bows of acquaintances perhaps she did not see them through the meshes of her veil lady pevensey sat upon her left in extravagant mourning she always went into black upon the slightest provocation believing that it gave her a distinguished appearance and indeed mr clavering in spite of the solemnity of the occasion could not prevent his thoughts from dwelling upon how handsome and well-preserved a woman she was he sat across the aisle from her together with lord meldrum it seemed to him that meldrum looked years older than he had done yesterday it was as though something of the oppressiveness and sordidness of the courtroom had descended upon him crushing the boyishness and the exuberance of spirits which he had hitherto kept alive in spite of conventional training and the responsibilities of manhood the bronzed pink of his complexion had given way to pallor his eyes were shadowed their bright blue darkened and his clean-shaven mouth wore a severe determined expression but his bearing was perfectly calm perfectly correct as conventionality required and he was apparently unconscious of the glances of mingled curiosity and admiration bent upon him harry brooks was seated directly behind lady ursula and his nearness to this exquisite woman of the world served only to emphasize his own commonplaceness once he ventured to lean forward and whisper to her a proceeding which seemed to annoy her extremely and elicited from her a very curt reply the secretary sank back abashed but with an angry gleam in his eyes and turned his gaze upon lord meldrum an unfriendly and vindictive gaze toward the back of the hall mr clavering espied mary gray quietly and tastefully dressed in her favorite color when she met his glance she did not smile as usual but gravely bowed then her eyes travelled to lady ursula's black-robed figure and a great pity came into them mr clavering had never seen mary gray in such a mood as this and it somehow increased his apprehensions as to what would be the outcome of the inquest the physician who had been summoned on the night of the murder was the first witness called his testimony was mainly concerning the nature of portstead's wound the bullet had pierced the heart and death must have been instantaneous the body lay upon its back on the library floor midway between the garden door and the circular staircase he believed that the probability of suicide should be eliminated it was barely possible that the wound could have been self-inflicted but with difficulty and the absence of powder marks seemed to prove that the shot had been fired from a distance of several feet moreover the weapon had been missing and only found after systematic search mr clavering wondered who it was that had authorized mary gray the discoverer of the pistol to make a systematic search but the coroner was asking a question the significance of which appalled him you have stated doctor he observed that the shot was probably fired from a distance of several feet and that the body was found lying midway between the garden door and the circular staircase now in your opinion could the shot have been fired by a person standing either by the stairs or by the garden door the physician considered before he answered in my opinion mr coroner it could have been and probably was fired by a person standing either by the stairs or by the garden doorway 
At this, Robert Sylvester, with white face, suddenly sprang up as if to refute the statement, then set his lips and as suddenly sat down again. His action created a stir of commotion through the hall, and the usher called for order. The report of the coroner's physician came next, and was mainly corroborative of the preceding testimony. The post-mortem examination showed that the bullet had entered the chest in the third left intercostal space, and had taken an oblique course backward, piercing the heart and lodging in the muscles to the left of the spinal column. He reiterated the improbability of the wound being self-inflicted, and in response to the coroner's question stated, as his colleague had done, that the shot might have been fired from the circular stairs or from the garden doorway. "'And which is the more likely?' asked the coroner. Robert, excitedly leaning forward, seemed to be hanging on the physician's answer. Conventionality counted not a straw's weight with him, he scorned, or was utterly unable, to mask his emotions. At length the physician's answer came. That is impossible to say because of the level course taken by the bullet. Robert sat back, distinctly relieved. That will do, doctor, said the coroner. You are excused. Next witness, please. And now it was Lady Ursula's turn. She must face the ordeal for which she had nerved herself. There was an immediate craning of necks and eager whispering as she rose instantly, but without perturbed haste, when the usher called her name. "'For God's sake, be careful,' was Robert's muttered injunction, audible to Mr. Clavering across the aisle. At the coroner's request, Lady Ursula raised her veil, and a faint color stole into her cheeks as she met the merciless battery of eyes. A limpid, tender look came into Meldrum's as he beheld her standing there, tall, elegant, in the glory of beautiful womanhood. She was still composed, even slightly disdainful, of the undisguised, inquisitive, or coldly appraising stares leveled upon her, but one felt the will-power behind her composure. With a quiet, thank you, she accepted the chair offered her, after having kissed the Bible and taken the oath. Mr. Clavering expected her glance would fall on Robert, whose agitation was so great as again to draw the attention of the coroner upon him, but instead her gaze sought Meldrum's and held it steadily, until the coroner, after a few preliminary questions, startled her from her studied calm by asking again when she had last seen the deceased earl alive. "'At dinner Tuesday night,' she faltered, now flashing a peculiar glance at Robert. "'And not later?' questioned the coroner. "'No.' "'Your ladyship is sure?' Lady Ursula raised her head with a haughty gesture. "'I have answered you, sir.' The coroner received the rebuke with darkening face and his voice was hard as he put the next question. "'What were your relations with your deceased brother? Were you on affectionate terms?' There was a slight, barely perceptible curl of Lady Ursula's lip. "'My brother, the late Earl of Portstead, was not a man to be on affectionate terms with any one. His was a cold and restrained nature.' The coroner tried once more. "'Well, then, were you on friendly terms?' Lady Ursula fenced again. "'He was my brother, sir.' Why should we not be on friendly terms? The coroner was conscious of a sense of irritation at her refusal to make a direct answer, and something of this showed in his tone as he said, I don't know why you should not, my lady, but I ask if you were. Lady Ursula seemed at last to become aware that she was alienating the sympathy of the audience by her parries. She took herself in hand once more and replied in an even voice, I think I may say that we were. The coroner let this pass. And was your younger brother also on friendly terms with the deceased earl? The note of sarcasm in the coroner's voice was not lost on Lady Ursula. In spite of herself, she flushed with anger. Am I here, sir, to answer personal questions that can concern only the members of my family? Your ladyship is here to answer any questions that I may put to you in the interest of the case, replied the coroner sternly. In the interest of the case, yes, she said haughtily but I shall decline to answer any questions that I consider purely personal and entirely irrelevant. "'Your ladyship will do as you think best about that,' retorted the coroner, giving rein to his irritation. "'But I warn you that refusal to answer creates a bad impression upon the jury.' Lady Ursula compressed her lips and awaited in disdainful silence the next question, which amazed others as well as herself. "'What were the relations between your deceased brother and Lord Meldrum?' The color mounted now in Meldrum's cheeks, but Lady Ursula went white. 
they held differing political opinions as i presume you know she answered with lip which would quiver had they any personal quarrel persisted the coroner lady ursula struggled to recover her poise she looked again upon meldrum's fine face and said with a proud ring in her voice which she did not seek to still lord meldrum is not a man to indulge in petty personal disagreements or quarrels and my deceased brother as i have stated was of a cold and restrained nature but the coroner was not satisfied i am told that lord meldrum had a late interview in the library tuesday night with the deceased earl was it an amicable one harry brooks bent forward at this and fixed his burning eyes on lady ursula mr clavering for the second time had a strong desire to thrash the little secretary he knew at whose suggestion this question had been put lady ursula studied the coroner's face as though to read his purpose in this last question then she answered coldly i was not asked to be present at the interview the coroner abruptly changed his tactics your ladyship's chamber is in the west wing opposite the circular stairs it is so that if there had been a quarrel and the door leading up to the stairs had been open as it was found to be when the body was discovered you would have been likely to hear it lady ursula hesitated a perceptible length of time robert was watching her fearfully i might have heard she said finally if my own door had been open was it open that night no she replied in a constrained voice mr clavering felt that she was not speaking the truth and it was borne in upon him that the coroner's questions were tending to implicate not robert but meldrum he dreaded harry brooks testimony but the coroner had not yet finished with lady ursula where was your ladyship when the shot occurred in my room with the door shut certainly you heard the shot with distinctness an irrepressible tremor shook her with horrible distinctness the coroner's manner grew openly aggressive your ladyship heard the shot with horrible distinctness even with the door closed he said harshly and yet you have just stated that under the same circumstances you would not have been able to hear the sounds of a quarrel lady ursula bit her lip i have said she responded with hauteur that neither lord meldrum nor my deceased brother would have been likely to indulge in vulgar quarrelling in any case i think you will admit that a pistol shot has remarkable carrying qualities the coroner conceded this but he was determined to press her beyond retreat i am to understand then that your ladyship heard no sounds from the library no sounds of voices raised in dispute until the shot i have given you to understand that sir at this juncture burton whom mr clavering had not observed before hastily stepped forward and passed a card to the coroner he read it slowly and turning again to lady ursula asked you did not then hear your younger brother robert sylvester when he returned from the country club entering the manor by the garden door into the library where the deceased earl was waiting up mr clavering heard a gasp from elsie baring and saw a bitter smile cross robert's face lady ursula started up from her chair her eyes flashing like those of a baited animal at bay the insistent official had at last succeeded in breaking completely through her defences she had not even the barrier of hauteur left who says my brother returned she demanded desperately no matter who says so my lady did he return no no she cried vehemently it was easy to see that not a soul in the hall believed her the coroner felt that he could afford not to urge the point we will go back a little my lady he said striving to speak in a calm official tone when you heard the pistol shot what did you do i i obeyed impulse and rushed down the stairs the circular stairs suggested the coroner gently yes that is no hastily correcting herself i went down the great staircase the main staircase mr clavering had the same sensation of doubt and misgiving that he had experienced when she had previously stated that she had gone down the great staircase there was almost compassion in the coroner's eyes as he asked is it not rather strange that with the circular stairs directly opposite your door you should not descend them but instead should traverse the entire west wing and go down by the main stairs she stared at him terrified i was beside myself with fear i did not know what i was doing i did not know where the shot came from my lady the coroner leaned toward her and surveyed her with searching glance shall i tell you why you did not go down the circular stairs because you were already there in the library lady ursula swayed in her chair 
a wave of excitement stirred the spectators lord meldrum his correct composure long since shattered looked as though he could have crushed the pitiless magistrate robert's expression was terrible he shook off elsie baring's restraining hand and springing toward the coroner's desk cried wildly i wish to testify End of chapter 19